I'm SP from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a show about the general Marvel comic universe, part of the Guinea Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other hilarious and fun geeky shows at guineageeknetwork.com. I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room. Yes. Of course. The hair. When did it go? You're, uh, what, 23, 24? Enjoy it while you can. <laughs> you know, Jack, I would love to know more about you. Your, your life, your childhood. I mean, it's your call. I don't really know where to begin. Then perhaps you might tell me the reason you decided not to know me. <laughs> and welcome to Smoking and Drinking in Space. This is a sci-fi podcast from a couple guys who think they know sci-fi. And this week we continue our coverage of the final adventures of the geriatric crew from The Next Generation starring Professor X, David Xanatos, and Jack Ryan's wife. It's season three, episodes three and four of Star Trek Picard. But first, he's the guy who SBDs the elevator as he's leaving and you're trapped in his vapor trail for 15 floors. It's Rob. How are you doing, Rob? Um... Well, first off, it would never be silent, but it would be deadly. <laughs> I, don't, I believe that of you. I don't remember. I believe that. that I believe yeah. that you'd be walking off the elevator and just let one rip <laughs> as the doors are closing. And yeah, I, I, I see you doing that. I don't, I don't remember that in the show. What do you mean you don't remember that in the show? The goo guy knocked off Jack's mask and then left him there oh. to choke on the fucking oh, deadly gas. I gotcha. I gotcha. Uh, I, I see what the reference is. Okay. Yeah. I was I was like, I don't remember there being any like gas in an elevator in a turbo lift. I was <laughs> I was trying to make the turbo lift reference there. Oh, I'm like, gotcha. Yeah, I know. I don't I don't remember that. It's a metaphor. Yeah, I no, I gotcha. I'm with you now. I'm with you now. Okay. Uh, we're gonna have to talk about goo guy. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about Goo Guy, definitely. Yeah. All right, so you got any news for us this week? Um, yes, um, I'm supposed to. That doesn't mean you do. But I do. Okay, good. Um, well, why don't you lay it on us? So, the first news I have is, um, well, apparently we've been, we've been, we've been tempting fate, Jason. How so? Well, there's a there's a French dude. We can blame the French, uh, but there's a French dude that's been um, messing with uh, viruses. Okay, how? Well, well, a uh, this French scientist has revived what they are calling a zombie virus. The fuck that. That spent 48,500 years in permafrost. So basically, this dude has been messing around up in the Siberian uh, wilderness. And in 24, uh, I'm sorry, in 2012, he revived a wildflower from a 30,000 year old seed. Um, and so that was kind of cool. But he was like, nah, you know, wildflowers, that's old news. So in 2014, he revived a virus uh, that his team had isolated in permafrost. Um, lucky for us, uh, it only targets single-celled amoebas, not animals or humans, at least yet until it mutates. Right. But, you know, that wasn't good enough for him. So... In 2015, he isolated a different virus type um, and revived it. So we have basically got a, um, we've got a crazy French dude going around trying to tempt fate again. 
Okay, so where does the zombie part come into this? Well, because it rev- he revives the fi- the virus. Oh, okay. So they're yeah. okay. So when you say zombie virus, it's like a virus risen from the dead. Even right, though, right. Even though viruses aren't technically alive. Well, you know, um, he says that uh, you know, seeing as they are still infectious, uh, they are. Uh, um, and, and he revives them or, or makes them viable again, uh, he considers them a zombie virus. Me, personally, I think he's actually found a zombie virus. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's just a matter of time before 28 days happens. Yeah, yeah, COVID 2023. <laughs> nice. All right, what else you got? Um, did I talk about uh, space and um, stuff in space last week? I don't. I don't remember. I I'm pretty sure did. you did. Did I? You do it pretty much every episode. Okay. Well, only reason why is because I can't. Well, no, no, no. See, this was published six days ago, so there was no way that I was able to have talked about it last time we recorded. Um. So, are you allergic to bees? No, not that I know of. Okay. Are you allergic to tree nuts? Nope. Okay, so you're going to be safe going up to uh, space. How's that? Well, um, because you don't. Are there need a to lot work. of bees and tree nuts up in space? <laughs> no, but but you uh, y- you know, if you were allergic to those kind of things and had some sort of anaphylactic reac- uh, reaction, uh-huh. you would need to take an EpiPen, right? Sure. Unfortunately, when you take EpiPens up into space. Um, yeah, they basically turn into something toxic for humans to ingest. Really? Epinephrine turns toxic in space? Yes. And, uh, it took, um, it took some elementary school students to prove to NASA that EpiPens become toxic in space. Wait a second. How? Okay. You're going to have to explain that. Now, now, granted, now these elementary school people were from uh, Xavier's School of <laughs> Gifted Youngsters. Oh, I'm sorry. No, St. Brother Andre's School Program for Gifted Learners. I was, I was, I misread that. I misread that. Um, yeah. So these students in Ottawa, uh, I think that's in Canada. Yeah, that's um, Canada. Yeah, there, it's missing a U, so I wasn't quite sure. Um, anyway, some people from Ottawa, uh, nine and nine to twelve year old students were experiment, experimenting with epinephrine samples. Um, they were placed into tiny cubes and sent to the edge of space. Um, I think they hitched a ride on some of the Chinese balloons. <laughs> to get these things taken care of, um, and then when they came, when they brought them back, they uh, had them, uh, they had them analyzed um, at a mass spectrometry fa- spectrometry facility. Spectrometer, no, no, spectrometry, spectrometry okay. facility. There we go. There we go. And uh, when they tested them, they found that only eighty-seven percent of the samples contained pure epinephrine while the other 13 had been transformed into extremely poisonous benzoic acid. So if you take an EpiPen up to space, you've got right. about an 87% chance of surviving an injection. Y- yes. Or dying right then and there. No, that's a 13% chance of dying. Yeah, well, yeah, you have an 87, you said 87% chance, right, of an, of, of surviving the, the surviving, injection. Yeah. Or you die right then or and there. Or you die because, right then and there. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so it, uh, the after samples showed signs that the epinephrine reacted and decomposed when exposed to the cosmic radiations. Um, and, uh, they also found, uh, well, it raised it raised questions about the efficacy of the EpiPen for astronauts, or right, I guess for uh, travelers heading into Mars or something. Sure. Um, yeah. So how long so, how long were these samples exposed to cosmic well, radiation? How long were the Chinese air uh, balloons up in 
the sky? Well, I don't know. I mean, you figure that the Chinese balloons, when they came back to Canada, were probably just dropping off the samples. So how long did it right. take them to go, I guess, doesn't full It circuit? doesn't say. Yeah, it doesn't say. They, they sent them up in a high-altitude balloon or even a rocket. Uh, it doesn't say how long they sat up there. Hmm. Uh, but their next step is to try to design a container that will shield it, uh, shield it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, protect it while in space. Um, They are and Apparently these kids are uh, quite bright because in June, they're going to head over to the Langley research center in Virginia and present their findings to NASA. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. What else you got? Yeah. Yeah. All right, last thing that I have, uh, this uh, this was published two days ago as of this recording. Um, there is a uh, astronomer in Japan that uh, caught uh, on film, on camera, uh, an asteroid or a, or a meteorite. Um, I guess it wouldn't be an asteroid. An asteroid would be a little too big. A meteorite uh, slamming in to the moon. Okay. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. I sent you a link in the super secret discord uh, channel. Um, okay. And you can kind of see if you scroll down in that clip, there's some Japanese writing down there for Twitter and yeah. you can say, see more. Yeah. And if you play that down there in the bottom, uh, right might you blink and you miss it type of deal you'll see in a little oh explosion. yeah there it is yeah yeah so i thought that was kind of interesting this happens all the time um uh, it's just whether or not we can see it you know whether or not it's it's right. happening when we can when we can view it because uh, most of it happens on the the back side or the dark side um or the dark edge of sure. of the moon um, so kind of interesting. Uh, they're hoping to, uh, what, which one is it? It's the, the lunar, uh, the reconnaissance, uh, lunar reconnaissance, uh, hold on. Let me scroll. Lunar reconnaissance orbiter or even India's, uh, um, uh, um, Chandrillion. Uh, that's not how you say it, but it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, to Lunar Probe. They're hoping that they'll be able to get some uh, images from that um, soon, you know, when it when it comes up in their orbit. Uh, so to, to see what the impact is, uh, especially since you saw it, you know, you can see it happen. But right. these things are moving at like 30,000 miles per hour, which is 8.3 miles per second. So... Uh, so high like velocity. a jogging pace, a good brisk yeah. jogging pace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good brisk jogging pace. I do an eight point three mile per day pace. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, you know, so it generates a lot of heat, and so when it when it hits, it basically it explodes and vaporizes. So you get a you get a visible light, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, yeah, I've never seen a image like that. Yeah, that was kind of cool. Yeah. See, I bring cool shit sometimes. Uh, I said sometimes. Okay, sometimes, yes. Not all the time, but sometimes. All right, anything else? Nope. I'm done. All right, well, let's do a pod crawl, shall we? Okay. We can call it, I don't know, say a pod crawl. The pod crawl. Pod crawl. Pod crawl, pod crawl, excellent, insert it deep, pod crawl. Kind of like a space suppository full of information. The Titan is in a shitstorm at the moment, and Shaw gets bounced around the bridge taking some serious karmic damage and transfers command over to Riker. Picard wants Riker to stop being such a wuss and fight, but Riker is older and wiser now, and hasn't been able to pull off the Riker maneuver in years, so he turns tail and runs. Beverly and Picard have a heart-to-heart about their last tryst near a waterfall where Picard knocked her up. Picard wants to know why he kept her a secret, and Beverly not so subtly suggests he would have been a horrible father. Beverly tells Picard that she told Jack where to find him and encouraged him to meet his father, but it turns out Jack didn't really want to have the difficult conversation about Picard's hairline. 
Jack, meanwhile, is working with Seven on figuring out why the Shrike is able to find them. They determined that the tacos the Titan had a while back are not sitting well, and it's crop dusting the nebula. The Shrike is just following the smell of taco farts straight to their source. When they find the leak, Jack sets to repair it and gets attacked by one of Odo's cousins who rips off Jack's mask so Jack will go night-night choking on taco farts. Seven finds Jack Dutch oven and rushes him to sick bay and then starts looking for the goo monster. Meanwhile, Riker is finally convinced to turn around and fight after they make their way back to the edge of the nebula, but keeps getting turned around after Captain Chell on the Shrike uses her portal gun to keep throwing the Titan back in. Riker sets up an ambush, but the Shrike isn't in the position he was expecting and instead of pulling out, Riker never pulls out, he pushes the attack and fires four photon torpedoes, which then get portal guns straight into the Titan's ass. Disabled due to an unexpected and violent colonoscopy, B-571 starts falling into the center of the nebula. Captain Chell is ordered by her boss to pursue, even though it greatly risks her ship. The Titan, with only a few hours of power remaining, starts making final plans and updating its will. Picard invites Jack for a drink in the holodeck, which has its own power source because reasons, and Seven is still looking for the goo monster. Seven seeks help from Captain Shaw, who is too stubborn to die it seems, and he tells her to look for the goo pot where she can find some resi goo that she can use to find the goo monster. Riker makes up with his work wife and invites Picard back on the bridge to go over options, and Beverly is timing contractions that are lighting the ship up like Christmas. The plan is to ride the electric contractions out of the nebula by surfing on them and charging the batteries at the same time. They get everything set up, and while Shaw is opening up in the cells, because he's the only one on the ship that can do it for some reason, the goo monster reveals itself and gets vaporized by Seven. The Titan hangs ten out of the nebula, Riker throws a brick at the Shrike on the way, and roll an explosion of glowy baby space jellyfish. Credits. All right. Episodes Sweet. three and four of Star Trek Picard. What'd mm -hmm. you think? Um... I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> we're, we're, we're going nowhere fast. I, I, I can see that sentiment, kind of. I mean, we've, we've established quite a bit, even in these four episodes, even though we're still kind of in the same location uh, doing this thing, right? But again, we're only four episodes into the, the season, so that's what, 40%? Out of, out of 10. So we're 40% right. through the season at this point. Uh, we're definitely in the middle of the season or the beginning of the middle of the season. So I, I expect things will start moving a little quicker at this point, but we've still established quite a bit. So we've we've got some good character development in terms of Shaw. We learned a lot more about Shaw and why he's very resentful of Captain Picard. Uh, we've learned a little bit more about Jack and why he uh, is a little standoffish from Picard. We've even learned a little bit more about Picard, right? And this is a character that we've uh, spent seven years with, plus four or five different movies and uh, two new seasons of his own show. So we're still kind of developing characters on both Picard and Riker and Beverly. So we're learning a, a little bit more about these characters. So there's there's been some some movement now, for the overarching plot, we've still seen a, a little bit of movement here. We're still not quite sure. There's still a lot of mystery around Jack and why the uh, the changelings want Jack. Is it the changelings that want Jack, or is it somebody that the cha that has hired the changelings to get Jack? Um, we s we know that the changelings may be preparing for war against the Federation at this point. Uh, there's some some rumblings about that. Um, we don't know why they want him, but they definitely want him alive. Otherwise they could have killed him many, many times over. So Jack is kind of the Titans plot armor at this point because they need him alive. Right. Apparently what? Okay. So is Vedic Ved, Vedic? Yeah. Vedic is Vedic, um, a changeling. Yes. Yeah, you saw okay. that whenever she was communicating with her boss. She cut off her hand and then reattached mm. it. Okay. So, I don't... And maybe this is just nostalgia talking. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like the changelings. Why? I don't like what they did to it. You know, in, in, in DS9, they were this just 
golden glue or goo, uh-huh. you know, they, they were just kind of just a slug. Right. And so, and then now they're like pink and white and sinewy, weird looking stuff. You know, it's just kind of, it was like, yeah, but I why, mean, that may have been the, the good thing that may have been the CGI at the time. This may be how, okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Sorry. I mean, oh, I, I'm fine with you updating the CGI, but you basically. But this may have been how they were imagined to begin with, and they just didn't have the technology to really pull it off in a um, an economic way. Yeah, but you've already established it. I, it to me, the, I, I understand updating it, but to me, they went a little, they went a little too far. Okay. Um, you know, if they would have, if they would have kept the golden hue, I think I would have been more on board with it. Um, but it, it just, it made it look, it made it look like, man, I don't know. It, it kind of reminded me of just like, uh, Play-Doh and I don't know. Well, it, it, it reminded me kind of a, as a, a biological or an organic goo. I mean, it's kind of pinkish and, and whitish. And I mean, you've got, you've got this, this biomass that's able to reshape itself. So, I mean, it, it, it worked for me, but I didn't watch that much DS9 because I don't watch shit shows. And so I'm not all that familiar with a lot of the, the changeling stuff in DS9. I mean, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Odo. I know that he's a changeling. I think I may have seen him change once, but I, d- I don't really remember what it looked like. So I'm not, I'm not that familiar with how it looked on DS9. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, I mean, I did, I mean, I like, I, I, I thought it was interesting that they brought changelings in. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm still on the fence. But I mean, as as far as the character portrayal of the changelings, are you okay with that? I mean, yeah, again, I'm yeah. not I'm not familiar with all, all the the changeling mythology or yeah. you know their their motivations or anything. I don't know if during the yeah, Dominion so, War they were uh, whose side they were on. So right. So so the only. The only thing that I I so changelings have to go go back to their goo state, right? To rest and regenerate. It's like it's their sleeping. Um, but I I always seem to remember that it didn't matter what they used, just as long as you know something that contained them. Um, so I, I, I found it a little weird that it's like, well, everybody's got a goo pot, you know, it's like, no, you just find a pot or find something, you know, why, why do you have to have a special goo pot? Well, I mean, it may be like you can sleep in a a lot of places as long as you're, you know, somewhat comfortable and can actually get to sleep, but you prefer your own bed, right? I do. So if you could take your bed with you and if their bed is the form of some kind of goo pot, wouldn't you do that? I guess. Fine. <laughs> Not, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it was convenient, right? Sure. Need to find their goo pot. Sure. I'm on a secret. No, we'll see. Here's the thing. I'm on a top secret mission where I have to infiltrate a a, th- uh, a ship. Um, why, why risk exposing yourself by having a goo pot? I would have not had a goo pot. I would have used the planter and just been done with it. You know. Well, but there's a plant in that planter. No, you take the plant out. You go to sleep. You get up. You put the plant back in. Boom. That's a that's a big difference. fucking mess. Look, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> Who wants to sleep in a planter? Replicate, replicate yourself a bowl every night. Well, maybe that's what he did. Maybe he replicated himself a goo pot. And then left it? Well, I mean, reuse, recycle, right? Well, that's what the replicator does. It, it'll break down the 
dishes that they makes. But then he's breaking down part of his residue and Oh yeah, that's yeah. true. I'm not yeah. sure the re- I'm not sure that the replicator would take his residue laden pot kind of like I don't think a replicator would take his, your residue laden sheets. Uh, look, look. They stand up on their own. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, these were two interesting, uh, interesting episodes. So we, we get a lot of, of backstory, especially of how, you know, Jack got conceived. Um, it turns out that, that Picard and Beverly got it on, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. I guess four or five years after the events of nemesis somewhere around that timeline. Okay. Which I mean, yep. still makes your your theory viable that it was the metaphasic uh, particles or the metaphasic radiation from um, uh, insurrection. insurrection that that you know rejuvenated their their uh, horn dog ways. Yeah, their parent parts enough to to make a child. Yeah, uh, we learned that uh, apparently. Uh, Riker and Deanna are estranged. Um, Riker got the wanderlust or didn't want to. I I wasn't quite sure what was going on. See, yes, I I was confused on that because um, season one. Right. They were together. They were together. Thomas had already died. Sure. Right. So Thomas had already died. uh, And, and. Like and it seemed like it had happened a year, maybe two years, or something like that. It had happened a little. It had happened a while ago, right? And he seemed like he had come to terms with it. They had another child. Mm-hmm. Life is good, ish, you know. And now all of a sudden, he's like all butt hurt about his kid. And decides he needs to leave because he's making uh, Deanna butt hurt about the kid because of empathy. Yeah, I don't. I it just he seemed fine. He didn't seem like a dude that was hating life or you know regret regretting what happened. Yeah, you know? and it may have been. You know, with all the events that happened in season one and that bringing that back to the fore, uh, maybe that sparked, you know, sparked these feelings back in him. Uh, he started thinking about Thomas a little bit more. And that's that's what kind of started this whole thing. Because if you remember at the end of season one, he was leading one of the ships uh, that came to their rescue at that right. at, at the planet. Yeah. Can't remember what that planet's name was, but yeah, where no, where Sung was matter. and everything. AI, AI planet. Yeah. So maybe it was maybe that's kind of the beginning of of him leaving. You know, he was he used that as kind of an excuse to go off and do his own thing because he was upsetting Deanna because these feelings for Thomas were coming back up. Something like that. Maybe. I don't know. It just it seemed really like. Well, I thought they were good. Yeah, yeah, I did too. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and we may learn a bit, no, no, a little good. bit more later on in this the series. I don't know if uh, I don't know if they're going to have Deanna in, in person or anything. Uh, she's already been on two or three episodes this season just by uh, messaging and everything. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm right. still waiting for Jordy. Yeah, yeah. So when are they going to bring Jordy in? When are they going to bring Laura in? I'm kind of curious yeah. as to when or how long they're going to wait to do that. Because we know Moriarty's coming, and we know that Moriarty is probably going to be the their way of fighting back against Lore, which I think Lore might be kind of the puppeteer of all this. I think Lore may be the one that is pushing the Changelings to have war with the Federation and take all of this. I, I think he's the the mastermind behind all of this. You think so? I think so. That's my theory, anyway. Well, I'm thinking he's. I was thinking Lore was involved with the 
with the theft side of things with Worf and all them. You know, you know what they're. they're oh no no no! With. Wait 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 wait! I think I may have the chicken and the egg mixed up here. So what do you mean? Because the theft was from the Daystrom Institute, right? And that's where they right. were. That, that's where they were housing before. Mm-hmm. So maybe the theft, because they said, Worf said that the theft was, the theft of the portal technology was was a red herring, was a, a mislead or a distraction yeah, from the actual theft right. of so something they, much more dangerous. So I think the theft of something much right. more dangerous was lore. So I think the changelings are planning to use lore against the Federation. Okay. Maybe. We'll have to see. Yeah. They've got six episodes to do it in. Well, I mean, I think they can do it. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Maybe they'll get stuck in another nebula. Mommy belly. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. We'll get to the, we'll get to the nebula because I do, I do want to talk about some quabbles, but, um, jellyfish with eyeballs. Fuck. Yeah. Um, so we, we learned a little bit more about Shaw. Uh, we learned he's from Chicago, which makes sense. Um, that his experiences at Wolf 359 kind of made him into the uh, charming asshole that he is today. Um, well, apparently that's, that's a prerequisite for any captain is you have to be a charming asshole. <laughs> right, so... Picard, Picard was a charming asshole towards the kids. Yeah, that's true. You know, so it's a it's a prerequisite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't see Riker being a an asshole though. Yeah, he's charming. He, he's definitely we never, charming. We never saw how he was as a as a captain, really. Well, we've seen him as a captain in this series, barely, and he seemed kind of assholeish. He he told his best friend to fuck off. It was a little pissed. He'd just yeah. taken four photon torpedoes in the ass. They were his own torpedo. Look, that is dumb. <laughs> I hey. No, they were his own torpedoes, but it was Let's his escape. friend that told him to, to fire the fuckers. Let's escape. Oh, wait, we can't escape. We keep getting uh, portaled around. Let's shoot torpedoes at the thing that can portal you around. <laughs> Well, and, and I think that he should have called off the attack and reset. Whenever he, whenever they they sprung the ambush and found that the shrike was actually pointed toward them instead of away, right? Yeah, they they shouldn't. He shouldn't have pressed the attack at that point. He should have tried to uh, to to veer off, reset, you know, go back in the nebula, hide a bit, and then try and ambush again. I think that was right. Right. I think that was a tactical misstep. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was tired, cranky. Right, yeah, and under pressure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Make a split decision, and it didn't work out. Yeah, and they needed something to uh, bring them back to the middle of the nebula so that they could have their fucking uh, space jellyfish birth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got to they got to uh, ride the um, wave of amniotic fluid, maybe. Yeah, yeah, something like that. No, is that what that is? Ride the contraction out. Yeah, yeah, that was weird. That was a little weird. I mean, it was it was a callback to uh, encounter at Farpoint, right? It was a similar creature to what they had encountered at Farpoint. There were a lot right. of callbacks and, oh, and they're nostalgia. Doing so they're doing so many of them yeah. this season. There's a there's a ton of them. I'm trying to think. So Odo is one with the changeling. Um, Encounter at Farpoint is one. Um, oh, they had the whole um, uh, cryptic message at the beginning of the season. Yeah, a cryptic you know, message the, was was a call back to some of them. Was. They referenced Wolf three five nine and Lacutus. Right. Yeah. Um, what else? There were a couple of others that that I noticed whenever I was watching that that don't come exactly to mind. But yeah, they're doing a lot of of callbacks to. Uh, to the original run of the next generation, which I don't yeah. mind. I mean, they're not harping on them. Uh, I thought the I thought the space jellyfish was a little bit too much, 
thought that was kind of fucking corny. What was too much? The fact that they were space jellyfish or the fact they had eyeballs? Okay, so (laughs) I'm so sick of, and it's it's not just this show. Uh, Quantum Mania did it too, where you have these strange fantastical creatures and they're all fucking jellyfish. Mm Mm-hmm. If you want to if you want to make a strange fantastical creature in some sort of weird space thing, you make it a jellyfish. Why do you well, make it a jellyfish? Because I'm so sick of seeing uh, jellyfish in in places where Well Well, it's like it okay, so you know how in in sound sound editing or whatever, you know there's there's a there's a library of of stock sounds that you can get a hold of, <laughs> so right? You're saying everybody's just using a, st- a standard stock library of jellyfish, of CGI jellyfish. Yeah, yeah. You can <laughs> you can change the values um, a little bit. You know, make them more blue or more translucent. Um, I think there's even a tick box there that you know, with or without eyes. Well, that that um, tick box is important. Well, yeah, and, you know, so. So I think that's I think that's what it is. I mean, because I don't know how many times I've watched a movie where the the same um, gate creaking sound or heavy door creaking sound is there. The right, yeah. I always Wait, hear. How that. did that go again? I nope. You only get it once. Oh can, come on! No, no. You can cut it out and move it again. Here, hold on, hold on. Here it is. Here it is again. All right, no, so no, I left you some. No, no, I left you some blank. Oh, no, that's left you not some how this stick. works. You gotta, yeah, yeah, no. You got to no, use your you, mouth sounds. No, no, I left you. I left you a dead spot there so that you could stick that in there. Look, I'll even do it again. Just you know, no, three times no, is always no, the best. No. Here we go. You ready? No, I'm not doing it. You either make the mouth sounds or people will know that you suck. Okay, so I just did it like three times right there. I gave you a nice big space. You suck. Yep. That's what she said. I don't so know where to go with that, but anyways, I, uh, yeah, right. Yep, yep. I broke Jason. All right. So, what quabbles did you have? The so the space jellyfish is is probably my biggest uh, quabble in this show. Yeah, space jellyfish. All right. Uh, the quabble I had was basically the um, the changeling, just a little to me, a little too. F- far from the source idea so it made it a little rough to follow not i mean it was just it just it looked different um but i mean they so i understand i understand you there because they changed the look of the klingons and i think it's ridiculous i liked the yeah. look of the original or the the next generation klingons i thought they looked fine i don't know why they didn't just kind of update the makeup a bit to uh, make the prosthetics maybe a little sleeker or uh, a, a little, yeah, a little sleeker than than what they used to be. But I thought the the next generation Klingons and the Klingons that we got in the movies were fine. I don't know why they drastically redesigned the Klingons because they can. Yeah, um, but just yeah, because it, you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Right, and they made you know because they made the whole. Oh, egg drop soup. That's what it reminded me of. Egg you know, drop white, soup. Yeah, with the white wispy stuff, you know. It's oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm yeah. like, you know, so so in in DS9, I understand CGI is not that great, but I mean it was it was more of a changeling was a fluid. Right? It it looked more like a fluid goo type of deal. It looked it and, and to and this didn't look like a fluid, you know, you are an expert at fluids. So I, I can identify fluids like the best of them. All I have to do is taste them a little bit. Oh God. Do you, um, just throw up a little bit in your mouth? (laughs) I almost choked on my water. (laughs) Yep. You're welcome. So, uh, yeah. So the changelings were a bit of an issue, uh, for me, Uh, not a huge issue. It's just, it, it's a personal preference, I guess. Um, but I, and then, and then really the only other, the only other quabble is, is, I would have to say is just, we didn't, we didn't get anywhere, you know, in terms of, 
you, you know, we're we're basically right where we started after episode two, other than now we're free of the Shrike for now. We know they're coming back. But you know, it's like it it's like we picked up right where we left off in episode two. So it's and yes, we got a little bit of character development, but I mean, in terms of moving the story or moving the intrigue or or what have you a little bit further, not much of that happened. I'm going to disagree with you a bit there. So I think that okay. we did move the plot forward quite a bit. Uh, we did have some character development. And while we're in the same location, the Titan is in the same location as we have been for the last two episodes. Um it is it is moving back to Federation space at this point, but we 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 do know a little bit more about what's going on. So we know the capabilities of the Shrike at this point. We know that the capabilities of the Shrike are dependent upon the the uh, theft at the Daystrom Institute with the the portal uh, gun and everything, or the portal weapon, which they ejected. Yeah, which they ejected, and we're not sure if they're going to be able to get that back. We're not even sure if the Shrike is going to be able to, you know, be functional at this point, although they said yeah. it'll be a few hours before we get, you know, energy back online or whatever. Right. So um, we we know a lot more about the characters. We kind of know a lot more about the history of Beverly and Jack and what they've been doing uh, that kind of sets up this scenario. And we've gotten some glimpses of these like mental storms that Jack is getting. Um, oh, that's yeah, yeah. Kind of reminiscent of some of the mental storms that we've seen in season one. With who? Um, with uh, who was having those mental storms? I thought it was just. Uh, it was it was the sure. premonition of it was the premonitions of the big um the big bad on the other side of the portal that she was right. trying to to get uh set up. Yeah. I thought that was the AI having some sort of weird um uh, oh no, no, it was one of the uh one of the people that was in the um uh, in the Borg cube or whatever, and that's what caused it to go crazy. They had oh, that's right, that's right, contacted. That's right. Yeah, yeah, they got contacted by this this you know through a telepathic link or what have you. I don't know, but yeah, no, I don't think it's related. No, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying that it's related. I'm just saying that the hallucinations are kind of reminiscent of that. Oh, okay. But we we don't know why Jack is having these hallucinations, what's causing them. And so that's probably the key as to why they're trying to get a hold of Jack. Maybe he was exposed to something that are causing these hallucinations and he's carrying it or, um, you know, who knows? Trauma, trauma. Maybe, maybe it's a, maybe it's a trauma that they tried to wipe or whatever. And he's possibly, possibly. Yeah. And it's, ends up being key to the whole um, Dominion uh, changeling infrastructure. Maybe that too, yeah. Yeah. He's the key to finally ending the war, even even though the wormhole was closed permanently? I don't know. So I don't know. How did they get over? I don't know. Le- re- leftovers? Maybe there's another wormhole. Maybe. Maybe, Maybe the wormhole that they opened up in the first season. Second season? Oh, first season with the AI? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, maybe that's, yeah, it comes back through there. Or maybe that's the wormhole from the second season. Maybe it's the There's wormhole lot, from the second season. There are a lot of space buttholes in this series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this series does like its space yeah, buttons. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and you know, the only person that can really, you know, clear those out and make sure there's no polyps and make sure that they're, everything's okay is Picard ramming his spaceship right up its ass. <laughs> no, it's, it's Riker shooting photon torpedoes right up his ass because we know well, that he's good at that because he what? shot torpedoes no. right up his own ass. Now, see that was that was Riker 
trying to do what Picard is already good at. Doing, oh, gotcha, he gotcha. Failed. He didn't use proper uh, technique. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, final thoughts. Uh, let's better pick up a little bit. Really? Well, I mean, I'm just. Have, saying, you, did, have you not been enjoying the season? I, I think I mean, it's, it's got, fine. It's fine. I just it needs to pick up a little bit. You know, let's 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 get going. Let's get that ball. Let's get that ball rolling. I think it's got more. I think it's got a next generation feel. This feels like a a, a modern next generation series. Well, it's because the whole damn cast is here. Well, no, it's not just the 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 whole cast. It's the it's the pacing of the episodes. It's the content of the episodes. Sure, the nostalgia kind of kind of helps push it in that way, and the original cast. Even though there's only really three main cast members that we're interacting with at this point, that that kind of makes it you know feel that way. But I think it's it's a combination of everything. It's it's definitely a modernization of the next generation in in terms of look, but the feel is still there. Yeah. Okay. I'm enjoying it immensely. I think this is probably the best season out of, out of the three so far. Okay. All right. Congratulations. (laughs) We'll see what, we'll see how I feel next time. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you got a haiku for us this week. I do. Um, this one is called future weaponry. Ballistic space rocks choose from multiple sizes. Midgets go further. Oh my God. What was that last part? What? What did that last part refer to? Midget tossing? <laughs> Dude, I knew it. I mean,. We had asteroid tossing. Oh my god! Per- personally, I think midget tossing's a lot better. They go further. Oh my god! You're an awful, awful person. You got any awards this week? I, I do. There's no <laughs> midgets in these. <laughs> oh, uh, who's got your <laughs> black lung? So, I didn't see Vatic smoking. Uh. You know, she I thought kinda, I did. I thought she smoked a little bit in season, in episode three. May, maybe. Um, it looked like, it, but I know this isn't true, but it looked like Shaw had like a stogie or something that he was chewing on when he went into 10 forward because he was like, you know, high off his kite. But I don't think he did. Um, so I'm going to go with Doc Cottle. Okay. Well, I'm giving it to Vatic because I'm pretty sure she was smoking in... in- one of these two Maybe. episodes. Maybe. All right. Who's got your head lush? I gave it to Jack just because he likes the hard stuff. He doesn't want no bougie wine. Yeah. Yeah. So Jack's getting mine because oh, he, uh, cheap stuff too. He likes the hard, yeah, cheap stuff. He, he likes the hard, cheap stuff. And, and what he poured was Jameson. So, um, I, I'm a fan of Jameson myself, so he's getting mine. Okay. Uh, who's got your player? So, you know, you could give it to Picard for, you know, finding out uh, he's a dad, you know, hitting it and quitting it. Um, But I'm actually going to give it to Crusher for hitting it and quitting it and realizing Picard's not good for him. And keeping him, keeping it a secret from him. Yeah. yeah, I I was conflicted on on who I was going to give this to myself. I mean, yeah, I think I'm going to give it to Beverly as well, okay. just because I think she was probably she was she was definitely in control of the relationship because she was the one that that basically left and he pined after her for a while. So that right. definitely gives her the edge in terms of the the player award. So I'm giving mine to Beverly, but it's really hard to determine because you know. Uh, they they they've had such an on again off again relationship history yeah, they can't ever, that they can't ever it's decide. giving either one of them the players is kind of of cheap at this point. Yeah, yeah. But Beverly's getting mine. Mm-hmm. All right, who's got your purple hippo? Um, 
So you could give it to the producers uh, for Space Jellyfish, <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to I wanted to be inside the show, so I, I went with Shaw um, for being on the narcotics and what have you, and basically just tripping out enough that he tells off a retired am- admiral, but an admiral nonetheless. Well, he thought they were all going to die here in just a little True. bit, so he might as well get shit off his chest. True. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, he basically, you know, he did that whole thing, I guess, at that particular point in time, then realized that, you know, half his crew was there or whatever, and was all like, yeah, the, you know, don't mix your drugs, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. um, mine is going to go to Jack uh, for okay. the hallucinations that he had at the end of the fourth episode. So those were okay. those were pretty intense. He's definitely got some shit going on in his head that we're not quite mm-hmm. privy to yet, uh, mm-hmm. but definitely purple hippo worthy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So next week or next episode. Uh, we will be discussing episodes five and six called Imposter and Bounty. So we'll see what those have been. Uh, so these last two episodes were actually directed by Frakes. How do you think he did? Oh, uh, he does good. Yeah, I, I thought never... he did. I thought he did pretty good. I like Frakes directed episodes. Yeah. Uh, these never next two issues. are uh, directed by Dan Liu. Dan Liu. Um, so we'll see. I don't think he's directed anything. This season, no. So we'll see how he does. And then the next two are directed by Deborah Campmeyer. And then the final two are by a Terry Metalis. So we'll we'll kind of see how it does work. All right. All right. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Our intro and outro music is Welcome Home by Cambo. Pod crawl music is Snacks Picks by Machette. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. You can leave us feedback on our Discord channel at smokinganddrinkinginspace.com forward slash Discord. Or you can email us at smokinganddrinkinginspace.outlook.com. If you'd like to throw a few nickels our way, you can become a Patreon supporter by going to smokinganddrinkinginspace.com forward slash Patreon. And make sure to visit Gonna Geek for more great shows at gunnageek.com. For this week, I'm Jason. The other uh, sound that you always hear is the uh, one where the, they're dying. It's the death scream. Wilhelm scream, yeah. Whoa! Yeah, the Wilhelm yeah. scream. It's been around mm-hmm. for a long yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. All right, we'll talk to you next episode.